Hello, Sky friends, and welcome to Seasons of Skyrend, Book 4. We're a custom 5e D&D adventure that focuses on the stories of our characters as they seek to change the world, and how the world responds in turn. I am your host and DM, Scott, and you can find me on Twitter at TheScottBlake. Hi, I'm Chris, and you can find me at EwokKiller on Twitter. I play Finnegan Finn Tempest, a tiefling trainer, which is a Skyrim original class supported by the Metalweave Games supplement Baby Beastry. Finn is the trainer of Cerulius, a blue guard drake. Hi, my name is Nate. You can find me on Twitter at Skyrim underscore Nate. I play Darvin Grimm, the human monk, and I am currently hosting Cade, the demigod of the land in my brain. Hi, I'm Shannon. You can find me on Twitter at Skyrim underscore Shannon. I play Aranus Gray, the god of rebellion, and I am a half-elf bard. You can also find the show on Twitter at Skyren Podcast, and you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Podcast. Head on over to find out about bonus chapters, early access, NPC creation, and more. Now then, thank you for joining us, and please enjoy this chapter in Seasons of Skyren. Wonderful. Take a seat wherever you like. There's, there's no assigned seating here. Antidius is sat at one end, Kandiva is standing behind him. You can sit down if you want, or you can stand. It's your call. Let's get to the rest of the people here. As you stand around, or sit around and wait, you can hear some horses. Certainly smells of hay, and a little bit of animal waste as well. It's rugged. It's dirty. But one by one, representatives from each of the guilds and churches here in the city arrive. There is the head of the Church of Olwenir, Venla. He is an elf. He wears loose green and gold robes over a frail frame, withering bone chips flaking off, loose rings on bony fingers, a gold necklace with a symbol of the church, shoulder-length gray hair, pale blue eyes, and a slow gait. There's the head of the Corum Monastery. This is not who you met before. They did not, as far as you know, they did not send a monk who is also an assassin. This is Hale Cairncross, half-elf, partially human, they, them. They're wearing a loose red shirt tucked into high-waisted black trousers, couple leather belts, black overcoat with satin red lining, collars up, short brown hair, slicked back. Green eyes, high cheekbones. Very difficult to tell how old they are. There's the representative from the Working Hands, which is the Builders Guild. And she is Octavia Hill. She's a human. She has black work pants, black crop top, black cargo vest with pockets all over, filled with various building equipment, tools, nails, chalk, etc. Red hair and a messy ponytail, thick legs, broad shoulders, 30s. Or as I describe her in the parentheticals, Stage manager special. <laughs> <laughs> There's representative from the Rising Path, the Alchemist Guild. This is Junius. He is a goblin. He is wearing a white three-piece suit without a tie, made of thick canvas, sleeves pushed up. Half of his hair was long ago burned away. He has various scars and stains on his dark green skin. Piercing orange eyes. Appears to be somewhat elderly. Alchemy is messy work. <laughs> Mm-hmm. There is Kolyabara of the Servitors Guild, whom you've already met. She approaches in very much the same garb she wore before. She does stand taller than everybody else here, but once she sits, the difference in height, not so noticeable. There's representative of the Seamsters, the Tailors Guild here. This is Milt Swenson, human, he him. He wears a deep red pinstripe suit with a fur-lined jacket and cape, round glasses, rounder face, receding hairline. About five feet tall, out of shape. He's in his 50s. And finally, we have a representative from the Silver Purse, the Merchant's Guild. Everybody's favorite. This is Cottongale. She is a halfling. She is wearing a silver, blue, and purple paisley top, purple pants, a silver shawl. She has short white hair and tight curls, jeweled rings, pearl earrings, big frame sunglasses, 
And she's in her 70s, very much like a fancy grandma at church. And as everybody arrives, takes their seats, and Tidius stands, and he is about to speak as retreat enters in. Ah, I see our esteemed changeling representative has arrived as well. Please, join us. Retreat is still carrying that big hammer, just not dragging it in their hands at the moment. It is attached to their back. It weighs heavy on them. They are not exactly strong enough for this, but it has become somewhat a symbol for them. And they take a seat. And Antidia says, Welcome all. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us on such short notice. As you may all be aware, looks over at retreat and back to everybody else, there's been a bit of a shakeup at the greenhouse recently. As you may also be aware, the use of the central column has spiraled in recent years, becoming more eccentric with time. I will admit up front, my goal is to reduce its use to zero. I don't see any reason why we can't operate on our own. I'm not saying we outlaw magic, as he turns to Koliabara and Junius. Just that we decentralize this particular piece of it. I've met, bites his tongue a little bit, I've met with Arnus Gray here and his associates regarding my plan. This meeting is a compromise of that plan. He claims to know how to manipulate this magic on a more fine-tuned scale. If that's true, then surely the leaders of the city need to know how to do that. While I would prefer it be no one, because it's not on, if it is to be on, this knowledge needs to be shared. As we saw with Earl Earl, it is very easy to just do what you wish and not worry about those that it affects. Now then, if any are interested in my particular method, I have asked Condivis here to bring a magical item on which I could demonstrate this skill. And Condivis pulls an item out of his bag. It's a very simple pair of boots he sets down on the table. And Tidia says, these are not a danger to anyone, as they currently are, and as one would presume, not a danger after I demonstrate this, if need be. And Tidia will explain, these are enchanted boots for long hikes. They keep your feet warm, dry, and comfortable. You can hike and hike all day, no blisters, comfy feet. It's a very minor magic, but still, something he could demonstrate if folks were so interested. But, as the god of rebellion is wont to say, this should be a decision made by everybody. And that is why I've asked you to gather here, on this level, in the eyes of anybody who might want to see. And sure enough, a lot of the hands and stuff have gathered around at a distance and are watching curiously. This is a unique situation. People don't come up here for meetings. Plenty of looky loos. And Tidius continues, And with my piece out of the way, I would simply ask, do we want to learn how to manipulate this magic, or would we be better off simply turning it off? And there's some murmurings around the table. You know, some people are like, well, oh, turn it off. A little bit apprehensive, and some are like, I didn't know you could do that. That's interesting. Junius, the goblin of the Rising Path, he seems very curious about how you could demagic something in the way Antidius is proposing. But if anybody wants to jump in here and try to direct this conversation in any way, please do so. Finnegan has one question, but he's waiting for the right time to ask it, so he's not saying anything quite yet. Okay. In which case, as the murmurings continue, Junius won't stand up. He'll lean back a little bit. Well, Antidius, if what you say is true, you can demagic stuff. I'd be very interested to know how that's done. Looks like you've done a little bit to yourself, as far as I can tell. I don't know what kind of magic that is, but if this is something that could be bottled up and put to other uses, it could not only be profitable, it could be beneficial. 
So if nobody objects, Junius is saying, yeah, Antidius, show this off. I'm actually interested in finally seeing it, so I'm not going to stop him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Darwin, are you interested in seeing this too? Yep, I want to see. Mm -hmm. For the three of you, while Antidius is doing this, if you want to roll Arcana or Perception, you may do so. You might get a little extra insight into what it is that he's doing and what is happening. I'm definitely rolling Arcana here. Darvin Arnis? Perception. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to roll Arcana as well. Okay. Let's get those numbers, and then he will do it. I crit, so that's a total of a 30. Oh my. I got a 12. I got a 26. Damn. Okay, okay, okay. Darvin... 12 perception, you said? Yeah. All right. Arnis, you said that was a 26 arcana? Yep. And Finnegan, you said that was a crit arcana for a total of 30? Mm-hmm. Oh, man, oh, man. I'm very glad you crit. Because I can give you everything magically that there is to tell from just watching. Okay. Intidious pulls these boots close to him. Pushes his hair out of his face, pushes his goggles up, revealing just the inky black eyes that he now has. And he stares at these boots. After a moment, you can see a swirl around the boots. Darwin, it looks like a heat shimmer around the boots, beginning to swirl. And it begins pulling away from the boots and towards his eyes. As this moves through the air, you can see little bits of light in there, just pulling the magic away, pulling it out of these boots. And it slowly, slowly pulls this magic away into his eyes. Darwin with a 12 perception, that's about as much as you're going to be able to see. You can certainly see when he's finished as well. Like All of the magic has been pulled out, and it has been pulled up into his eyes. Aranus and Finnegan, with your arcana rolls, especially significantly higher, the magic that he is working is not just dispel magic. Finnegan, you had a brief glimpse at his notes before, up in his lab and in his workshop. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some dispel magic methodology in there. Well, that wasn't the end of it. One, because dispel magic is a singular action, and this is a continual pull. It's a continual drain. But also because, as far as everybody knows, Dispel Magic, pretty safe. You may have had a unique experience back in Honey Hollow mm -hmm. with that box, but that was absolutely unique. Nobody else has reported anything like that using Dispel Magic before. But you can tell once he's, you can tell once this process began, it just kept going until the magic was pulled all the way out. Maybe he could have stopped it. But it didn't seem like there was a lot of extra effort. Focus, yes. But he does not appear to be worn out by it. Arnis and Finnegan, I think the last thing that both of you notice is that as this magic is going into his eyes, it is vanishing. It is not being stored there. He is not consuming this magic. He is not bottling it up. This is not a way to empower himself. It vanishes. Gone. Don't know where. Finnegan with a crit. And also Finnegan with a crit. Mm -hmm. As this is being pulled into his eyes, you see deeper, magically speaking. For a moment in his eyes, you see the same sparkle, the same starlight type light as you saw in the hollow. Without reacting and thinking, moving purely on instinct, I draw my wand and I point it directly at his face. I say, stand down and don't ever do that blasphemous action again. Before anybody else at the table reacts, Darvin, Arnis, is there anything that you want to do to support or pull back your friend? If Finnegan reacted that way, it's for... A reason and so i am like i'm prepared to back his play whatever it is yep okay are you all still seated are you standing up is this like knocking chairs over in a rush 
Or is this calm and focused? Oh, I'm like the deadest, scariest, angry calm anyone has ever seen. To the point where I think Cyril is even like whimpering back away a little. At first I was thinking maybe she growls in agreement, but then I remembered her timid nature and mm-hmm. she doesn't mm-hmm. see you like this very much. No, no so one has seen me like it's this. It's <laughs> a little like ears back posturing like in, uh oh, what do I, what's going on? Is someone in trouble? Like in a bad way. Meanwhile, at the table, I'm just going to roll real fast for Koliabara and for Junius. The two who were more likely to know what might be happening. Not know, but perceive. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> Not with those rolls. For people like Milt Swenson, Octavia Hill, Cotton Gale, this is just magic. This is what magic users do. Retreat doesn't know much about magic, but probably generally doesn't really like it too much given their recent experience. Recent, very long experience. Venla and Hale Cairncross are confused, but nobody is happy that you just stood up in a bolt and pulled a wand and threatened the guy who brought everybody here together to discuss things, in theory, peacefully. Octavia Hill may just be the leader of the Working Hands, the Builder's Guild, but physically she's no slouch. But it's Kolyabara who speaks up first. Gentlemen, mostly targeting Finnegan with this word here, but trying to be a little bit more polite about it. Gentlemen, friends, colleagues, what? This is not why we came together. We came here to discuss the city, not make threats. Oi, and this man here is no friend to any living being on this realm if he continues to use that power. It represents a darkness that you have never seen before, and that you fear in your dreams and nightmares. What he did is an abomination, and should he or anyone else do it again, I will strike them down with my very last breath. In your ignorance, you idiotic fool, and your grasping for power of your own, you are feeding this darkness, no magic disappears. You are like a child playing with a fireball right now. Just like I told you in your office when I saw your notes. Finn, what are you talking about? He's feeding the looming tomb with every piece of magic he draws in. <sighs> okay. Um. Mumbles around the table. and People don't really know that term, that entity. You don't have to know what he's talking about to know that it's something that you, one, shouldn't be messing with, and two, not something you want to let out into this world. It does not belong here. It is not of this realm and should not be allowed to cross over here. And the more you feed it, which is what you're doing when you take magic from something else, the stronger it gets and the more likely it is to be able to enter our world. Oh, and you want to feed it the entire column of power. A bulb, no less. How long have you been serving the abomination? How much magic have you fed it? Antidius, very taken aback by all these accusations and these threats. Finnegan, he motions over to the table. Friends, I don't know what you're talking about. I want to roll an insight check on that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to, too, if I may. Mm-hmm. Darwin, you may as well. Yes, me three. I have a, a 17. Mm-hmm. I got a 22. Oh. oh. Arnis? I got an 11. <laughs> mm. wah, 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 wah. Yep. <laughs> but Finnegan and Darwin, he seems to be sincere. It, what he says next will seem to be what he believes. Like, okay. as far as he knows. I assure you all, this method, this methodology is a work of my own design. I don't know what a looming tomb is, but this particular 
method, motioning up to his eyes, his tongue, which had been replaced, came with extensive work, research, and experimentation. Myself and my followers did not accept these into our own bodies, thinking that we were servants of anything outside of the good for the city. If there is some being, some entity, that this man knows about, I do not know it. Kulyabara, Perha- can I ask you a question? I'm just going to run over him. <laughs> I'm sure. Can magic just disappear? Just go away completely? That's not entirely my expertise, but perhaps? Yeah, now I have a DM it question. Would... <laughs> All right, just a moment. Um, it would take skills or power beyond that of mortals that I know of, but what Antidius has just shown us sure looks like the magic disappeared. Sure. Sure, it, it, it looks like the magic disappeared. In my experience, all magic comes from somewhere and goes to somewhere. You can't just make it not. You can dissipate it, you can turn it back, but you can't just make it go away mm-hmm. without it going to somewhere. Right. And the whole conservation of energy, conservation of magic. Right. That was my question is like, is, is magic like matter? Like you can't create it and it really can't be destroyed. It can only be like changed. Cause like, I'm thinking back to like the bulb. The bulb, yes, you could say we destroyed the magic, but it resulted in a giant explosion equal to the amount of magic that was there. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. And someone lost an arm, and right, right, yeah, right. you made there a fancy magic item. There were consequences. Yeah. yeah. No, as, as far as anyone in the party would know, the idea of conservation of magic that you just change its state holds true. Okay, okay. cool. Then I have something to say. If Antidius is methodology of like making it actually disappear go away was true that would be a major breakthrough and in a way it does but in a very much more important way it does not right finnegan takes a moment looks around the room very showingly sheathes his wand okay and says oi let me say this as the most educated person in the room The only one who obviously has completed all of the magic training at the capital that is to be had at the capital's mages college. You cannot just make magic disappear. There are rules and laws that go along with it. If I were to take a a magic gem and smash it, that wouldn't make the gem disappear. It wouldn't make the magic disappear. It would react with an explosion or some sort of destruction where the gem disappeared. What you're doing here defies the laws of magic and is further proof that you're not just making it disappear. You're feeding an entity, yes, you may not have heard of it. Well, you also hadn't heard of me five days ago. That didn't mean I couldn't kill you. (laughs) All right. People at the table had started to calm down when you put your wand away. But then when you said that, like... (sighs) It's not the best Nerves way to came make right my back point, up. It's not the best way to make my point, but <laughs> Finnegan's a little scarred. A little bit. He kind of wore in the hollow with the looming tomb itself. And so. so I will end with this. You can deny the existence of this evil. This is the darkest, worst evil that the realm has ever seen. But I stood in its presence. I felt its malevolence. And believe me, when I say the last thing you want to be doing is feeding it, whether out of ignorance or idiocy, you don't want to be feeding it. Finnegan, mm-hmm. he needs to believe you. Please roll persuasion with advantage. If there are any other ways people want to help, please speak up now. Finnegan's getting advantage from his own personal traumatizing experience here. Speaking from the heart. Well, that's an 11. Any assistance people want to give to to Finnegan before I resolve the reactions here? I mean... I don't think I can. Uh Okay. Yeah, I've 
been talking and interjecting, I can back him up or give him some inspiration. <laughs> Let's say bardic inspiration would probably be the best use of it. Well, then that's what I want to do. Because he's already got advantage. You can't get double advantage. Right. Then, yeah, that's that's what I want to do. The die. A d12, my friend. Oh, thank the maker. Trying to be on y'all's side. It's a 14 total. <sighs> okay. Everyone at the table here, outside of your party, believes that you did have some sort of experience, that you are speaking from a place of truth. But it's difficult to say if they believe this is the only truth. And Tidious would be the one to voice this, but there are probably some others who might be having similar questions in their head. Finnegan, Mr. Tempest, did not mean to cause you any sort of alarm. And if what you're saying is true, that this method is feeding something, then it's simply a matter of finding a way to not do that. If it was going somewhere unknown to me before, I just need to change the destination, perhaps. But I think the more that we could learn about this looming tomb, the better... No. An unknown enemy is worse than a known one. I'm not saying we go and shake its hand. I'm saying if you have information about it, we should know about it. More than the control of this column here, if there is some deep, dark threat out there, people need to know about it. Do you have any other information regarding this looming tomb? Where is it? What can it do? I'm waiting because Shannon clearly looks like she wants to say something. I, well, I don't. Now he's asked a question. And so, like, all the stuff I was going to say is because he asked a question and I don't have any. Because, no, we don't. I uh, mean, you know, I have an answer. I'd share with him everything I do know, which isn't much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I have no reason to lie. I knowledge dump. So, you're going to share, like, the looming tomb can make vestiges of people, drain them of their life force. The looming tomb is coming. Yep, all of it. Every bit of it. Mm. He specifically said, other people have already been in contact with me. I'm on the way. Yep, all of it. And that he exists on the same plane as you all. This is yep. not an interdimensional being. I mean, yep. could be, but not in a different dimension currently. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And okay. all of it. When, when Finn gets done brain dumping, I will literally just tack on and it seems that the more you open yourself up to this entity even if it's just to study it and understand it and be prepared for it the more vulnerable you are to it and the easier it is for it to get here from wherever it is so while i agree with you that the devil you know, sorry, don't want to use that term. That's that, no. Yeah, that's I'm not a loaded that term. term. That's a loaded term. <laughs> you could just say the evil. The evil you know. The, the evil enemy you know. know. Well, I agree with you that the enemy you know is better than one that you don't. In this case, to know it is to be vulnerable to it. So you can know about it, but you can't study it. Kulibar asks. You say it's been in contact with other people here. Who? Where? If us studying it is dangerous, maybe we can get information from those who have already contacted it. And are they doing this willingly? Or are they, like Antidius here, stumbling on it? Yes. <laughs> they did do it willingly, but they didn't know what they were contacting. And... They are not necessarily a reliable source of information. Who? Oh, I'm sorry. That would be the uh, the former head of the Silver Purse in Caravel. Also, Orizaba. We haven't touched on the fact that Orizaba is still out there doing her experiments. Right, yeah. Cottongale speaks up. Lynn, you know Jarvis. <laughs> well, I mean, he's in jail now, but yeah, I know him. Word had gotten around to us that he's being held in uh, Karami now, if I recall. That's correct. 
And it's because of this. Oh, well, I mean, this is only part of it. <laughs> this is actually a very small part of why he's being held in Karami. <laughs> but also, he had a partner in Caravel who is still there. Are they also arrested? No. Which is why I say this is only a small part of why he was arrested. It was really a, like, knock-on to why he was arrested. We left Orizaba the Wise in Caravel before we knew what the looming tomb was. And before we knew how dangerous it was. And we only found out accidentally. And I don't suppose she would be willing to come here and enlighten us. She can't leave the city. She's in charge of it. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, one of you could go to her if you wanted. Can't stop you from doing that. Certainly an option. It would be a shame to lose Lynn Jarvis as well if he had a hand in this. Whatever he's been arrested for, hopefully there's not capital punishment on the table. I'm guessing there will be. <laughs> I'm guessing you so too. <laughs> if I had to take a stab in the dark, shall we say? Well, then we should act with haste. Needless to say, people here are concerned. If everything that you say is true, this is a very dangerous thing. And Antidius and his followers have implanted these things into their bodies. Removing them is not just taking off a ring or a necklace. It is surgery again. And there are many of them. And they are not all here in this room. So the chance that more could be doing it even on a small scale exists. But I think it's Octavia. Octavia Hill, leader of the Working Hands. She clenches a fist. Boom. Slams it down on the crate in front of her. Just to get attention. Look. This all sounds, for one, a little bit beyond my grasp, but for two, not the point of why we're here today. Mm. Now, if him using this whatever is feeding somebody more powerful than us that we don't want to deal with, that's one thing. But this bulb, that's why we're here. If Retreat over here and the other changelings are doing something to it, Honestly, hadn't seen so many changelings in this city before. Don't know if I ever have. But, again, not the point of why we're here today. Oh, you have. You just didn't know it. But continue. <clears throat> again, not the point of why we're here today. That's why I said continue. Arnis, yeah, but you still interrupted. Yeah. Let me, let me make my point, please, Arnis. If we're not turning off this column, if we're not going to depower it, Somebody's got to be in charge of it. Who's it going to be? And Tidia says you all know how to, how to use this thing. And if you're not sticking around, and honestly, nobody here has chosen you to be in charge, other people need to know what to do with it. So, what do we do with it? You going to teach everybody, or what? I mean, frankly, I will work with whoever wants to work with it, with a few notable exceptions. The reason we're having this meeting is because I told Antidius that I would be willing to teach some people what I know about the bulb so that they could manage it and manage the magic at a low level, right? Back to maybe what you were used to before. But I also told him that I didn't trust him with it. And frankly, now I feel justified in that mistrust. So. Literally anybody that's not one of the Antidians, I will be willing to show what I know. People are looking around the tables here. Hmm. Hmm. Like, who, who's going to be the first to say, like, I want power, basically? <laughs> that's a very good question. Who is the first to say they want power? If there's a pause, I have there is a pause. I can add. So if there's, like, a, a lull after I say this, like, I'm willing to teach anybody. I kind of look around and nobody. Then I go, okay, let me add something onto your plate. You no longer have Earl Earl, which means that you all, as the leaders of the guilds in the city, you are now the leaders of this city, which means you have to figure out how to run it 
however that looks for you. And as such, it's not just whoever can manipulate the bulb has the power anymore because I'm willing to open source it. So you all get to figure out how decisions are made regarding magic in this city. All of you, whether you use magic or not. I think Venla is the one who speaks up first from the Church of Olwen here, the elf. Well, Arnis, that's not entirely true, is it? We can make a decision as a group, he says. He stands up, like, puts his hands down, pushes himself up shakily. From what I understand, what I've heard from others in my church across Sarakar, Earl Earl being gone is not the only reason why there's not currently someone in charge. It's because the giants are, and they have yet to send their representative. Friends, colleagues, if we assume power now, it is only a matter of time before someone comes to exert the will of the giants here. I do want to know how this bulb works. I would enjoy being able to be of service here to help the people. But mostly it's so that when the giants do arrive, we do not lose our voice in this city. They may have final say, but if we collectively know how to use this, then we collectively hold some sway in the city. If unofficially. So I would suggest that we all learn something here, and that we all agree to work together, because when the giants do arrive, we should be united. <clears throat> and he sits back down. People are nodding. Darwin, Arnis, Finnegan, anything you'd like to say in response to him? Oh, just one thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's always just one thing. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. Venra was his name, yes? Venla. Venla. See, this is yeah. why I ask questions. Venla, I think you make a very excellent point. There is something to be learned by everybody here, and that the more you know, frankly, the more power you wield. I think, I think you're not wrong in assuming that the giants are going to assume power here, but I also think you're running on the assumption that the new boss is going to be the same as the old boss. And I'm not sure that's true. It may be, but it remains to be seen. So I wouldn't put all your eggs in the basket of, we don't really have to run this city until it actually happens. Folks around the table are nodding in agreement. While some might want to have a little bit more or a little bit less, they don't like the alternative. And Kolyabara asks, well then, what is to be done about... The Antidians, then. I suggest we... <sighs> I would suggest they take an oath that they do not use this ability until we know more. Cotton Gale from the Silver Purse and Milt Swenson from the Seamsters both nod in agreement like, yes, 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 we should learn more. But Milt pushes his glasses back up on his nose. It's too dangerous, too dangerous, too dangerous. Antidius sees kind of the way things are moving, like, not against him, so to speak, but like putting them in a box. He speaks up, says, If we agree to wait and hold off on use of this ability until we can get more information from either Lynn Jarvis or, or Zaba the Wise, that's fine, as long as there are no efforts made to extract this from us. It is not a painless procedure, and... It's also not like the parts that we removed are fit to be put back in, which is undoubtedly true. It's not like he put his eyes in another jar mm -hmm. and he's just waiting, like, can't wait to get these guys back. Like, nah, those ones have either been converted or they're trash. You should just know if you make this decision to, like, wait and see that the people that you're contacting, I don't know that they are even aware of the Looming Tomb's name. I don't know that they are even aware of what they have contacted. I, what makes this darkness so insidious is that it comes to people the same way it came to you. 
in that it doesn't come to them. It has this way to gain power through ignorance. Like we've discovered today, you had no idea you were helping it. I doubt Orizaba and Lin have any idea. They, In fact, I know after our conversations with them that they thought that they had just discovered a way to create magic without the divine. And we didn't even question it at the time. <laughs> and and I say this like with a, with a sense of like anger at myself for not questioning it. Mm-hmm. So far at the table, nobody is calling for Antidius's eyes to be gouged out or his tongue to be cut out or for Condivus to lose his hand, or anything to be done to any of the other Antidians. But they certainly don't want to tempt fate here by potentially contacting and feeding some malevolent force. So there's a general consensus. It is a curiosity, to be sure. I think Junius is especially interested, just because if there is a way to de-magic stuff in a different fashion, that's very handy for alchemy. But obviously, you know, knowing the risk is also part of alchemy. It's okay when you know you're building a bomb. You put on the bomb suit. But if you think you're baking a cake, that's a very different story. Okay. Hmm. Venla speaks up again. If you do wish to teach us how to do this, when do we begin? As soon as I can get a few ducks in a row. I need to talk with... With Olwan and, and, and Reistos here, who, like, all of us have pieces of this puzzle. It's not, it's not just me. And we need to figure out the best way to impart all the knowledge we have to you. Mm. It is not exhaustive, and you're going to be learning a little bit as you go, but we will impart as much as we can to you. Mm-hmm. I would implore those at the table, particularly those not magically inclined, Motions to Milt, Cottongale, Octavia. He doesn't know about Hale, uh, the leader of the Corum Monastery or not. I would suggest to even those not magically inclined that you learn what you can, even if it's only a little. And if you're not able to perform the tasks yourself, at the very least, you might be able to impart this information to others or keep an eye on those of us who do learn, if there's anything that we should have learned from these past years with Earl Earl spiraling, is that things need to be kept in check. And Milt, Cottongale, Octavia all nod. They're all very well aware of the idea of just sensible precautions and oversight. (sighs) Retreat stands up. Look, I... I do not intend to stay. I do not know how many of my changeling family here will. But this is not my place. My place is home. My home is elsewhere. My family is elsewhere. And the way they use family is, you know, both meaning direct family and indirect family. If any of them do choose to stay, I would highly suggest that they be kept in the loop as well. Considering our experience experience here under Earl. Earl, you can count me out. When my work here is done, I'm leaving. And they get up and they walk away. Kolibara asks, well, they do have a point. Shouldn't force it on anyone, but we should not exclude any who wish to learn. That being said, though, when and where do we start? I, Scott, am aware you said you need to get ducks in a row, but they need someone like are we starting tomorrow are we starting in a week can i ask the question like yeah how much in detail do we need to go with this can oh, we just we're gonna like, hand wave it hand wave it and dice roll it oh yeah oh no we're not even gonna dice roll it yeah no cool. no, no 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 it's i was gonna get to this afterwards but i fully intend this just to be like a and two months later okay we leave and you all can have like fancy new clothes from the seamsters because milt will hook you up you know, you can get some cool prayer stuff from the clerics. You know, any favors that you want from any of these groups, you can get for doing this task. And we will just... And we're there. No, no, no. I don't want to do all this. And unless anybody has a distinct desire to play through teaching people how to do this. No. Nah. And seeing what things fail along the way. No, no. Let's just... Hey, we spent a month in Earl and it wasn't terrible. Yeah. No, I understand the concern. 
you were the one who had ducks to get in a row. Oh, well, then I'd, we'll start tomorrow. Oh, okay. I don't know if those were a day worth of ducks or a week's worth of ducks. No, I mean, I just really need to make sure that I've talked to, like, Rice Dose and Olwan. Although, you know, give it a couple of days, because depending on what Rice Dose has to say, there might be more for me to learn before I start imparting things to people. Mm-hmm. Cleobara says, very well then. A week. Give everybody some time to gather themselves. Set aside their time accordingly. Send representatives if they do not feel up to the task themselves. I, for one, will be in attendance. Junius nods as he will be as well. As will Venla. The others, who's to say? But everybody seems interested. Like They either want to be there themselves, or if they can't make it work, they'll send somebody. Retreat's the only one opting out wholesale. Like, nope, I'm out. Don't even, don't even ask. They're already gone. We'll begin in a week, if that's fine. Are we to meet again here, or is there somewhere more appropriate? She says with a smile. Like, come on, are we really meeting up in the stables? I mean, you're learning about the bulb. This isn't theoretical. There's one at the bottom of this city. There's nowhere to meet but there. In the greenhouse, then, I take it. Yeah. Very well, then. I will see you there. She stands up tall, you know, over ten feet tall. Her wings open, pointed downward, and she exits out as confidently and as well-composed as she can. And others begin to follow, unless there's anybody in particular you want to stop here. Mm. But one by one, they each get up. Now that someone has been the first to leave, everybody's feeling more comfortable getting up and leaving. Venla is one of the early ones up, but he's slow and will make his way out. Except for Antidius. He and Condivus are just sitting there kind of confused as to what to do next, but it's up to them to figure out if you don't want a direct hand in it. But it's not like they're, you know, scheming, ah, how do we do this behind everybody's back? It's like, fuck, what did we do? Leaving the meeting and beginning the long descent back down to the rest of your allies, down by the wind-down room where you stayed the night. Ulwan and Reistos are discussing how this might be best to go about, Ristos has experience teaching people. His, uh, his demeanor, his bedside manner, so to speak, is not the best, but it is his duty. But his is more in the divine methodologies. But he does have some insight here, especially with his work on those runes. Olwan has hands-on experience doing various things with the central column, with the furnace, and believes that he can be an asset. The one thing that Ristos will say. He'll fly over. He'll sit on Darwin's shoulder. I can interpret those, but if we really want to know what they mean, understand the intent behind everything, might... You're not going to like it, but it might be good to have Ikiri's input on this. Not to say that we have to, just it could go faster. But that's a whole other set of problems. I understand if we don't want to dive into that. But when we get back to our room or wherever it is we're going to stay, I had a few things you're going to want to see. And with that, we'll bring this chapter to a close. But the story will always continue. Thanks again to all of our Patreon patrons for your support. If you'd like to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash Podcast and pick out a level that's right for you. Before we go, I'd like to give special thanks to everyone at the $5 and up tiers. At the $5 city council level, thank you, Shannon DeMello. At the $10 mayor level, thank you, Christopher DeMello. At the $15 governor level, thank you, Phoenix Bryan and Sierra Jones. Thank you for listening to this chapter in Seasons of Skyrend. If you like what you heard, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find us. If you want to chat, we're on Twitter at Skyrend Podcast. You can join our Discord server, or you can email us at skyrendpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us online at skyrendpodcast.com. As always, thanks to Daryl Barnes for creating our theme music. You can find them on Twitter at Daryl Barnes underscore. We also want to thank the talented at Gabby underscore Desu on Twitter for our fantastic podcast art. Thanks again for joining us. 
We'll see you next time on Seasons of Skyrend.